David Pollock began his career as an undergraduate in Alan Wilson's laboratory at UC Berkeley. Then after the NCI, he received his PhD in biological sciences from Stanford and in 1995 worked with Ward Watt and Mark Feldman. He then spent three years at the National Institute for Medical Research in London and UC Berkeley on the Hitchings Elian Fellowship from the Wilkins Trust, working with Willie Taylor, Nick Goldman, and Monty Slatkin. He then spent almost two years at Los Alamos National Labs, followed by six years at Louisiana State University before coming to the University of Colorado. His research interests are in evolutionary genomics and molecular evolution, particularly the interaction between protein sequence structure, function, and molecular coevolution co within and between proteins. We're very lucky to have David today, and his talk is entitled Adaptation, Coevolution, and Convergence in the Context of Protein Thermodynamics. Okay, well, thank you. Glad to be here. And um, yeah, I'm hoping to have some fun here. I'm going to um, talk about some, hopefully, some higher level aspects integrating those with the protein structure talks that you've heard recently. Um, I'm going to start out uh, talking just a little bit about what I mean by adaptation, evolution, and convergence. Uh, do a quick review of um, some of my recent work with Richard in case some people didn't see that all but it'll, it'll be a, a quick review and you can go into more, uh, if you want to get more, you can go into more detail uh, by looking at Richard's talk. Um, and then I'll talk uh, about a variety of projects that, that impact our basically general understanding of um, adaptation evolution in the context of uh, protein thermodynamic structure and function. So, let's make sure I'm in the right place here. Yeah, um, before I get started, <laughs> I hope it's okay, but I wanted to just give a quick plug here that uh, I'm actually got a lot of turnover. I've got a, I've got a number of people who got good jobs recently and are going to be taken off soon, and I also got a new grant on um, comparative analysis of vertebrate genomes. So I'm going to be looking uh, I'm looking for postdocs and graduate students on the um, the current N01, the analyzing context dependent evolution in proteins, and then also this new one, the comparative analysis of vertebrate genomes which includes uh, using TE transposable elements to look at mutation uh, and predict fitness. So um, overall, as, as geneticists, we're uh, interested in broadly in the study of the relationship between genotype and uh, phenotype. And um, in this context, we're doing, uh, we're looking at this, trying to understand those questions in terms of looking at sort of long-term protein evolution uh, and understand really how proteins evolve in the, in the context of their structure and function. And uh, we've, and, and other people as well, have been trying to move beyond some of the more classic models and, and consider a number of um, uh, different processes that are really more uh, reflective of how proteins probably uh, actually evolve. Um, and that includes, uh, first off, thinking about site rate and constraint, that is uh, heterogeneity, that is the heterogeneity in the process. Uh, of evolution at individual sites or residue positions in the protein. Um, and as you can see here, this is just meant to indicate that there might be different types of processes going on uh, at these different points um, in the protein structure. Uh, generally, I'll ca talk about this as structural and functional context dependence, so trying to keep this, uh, this concept to a very, very general level. Um, we also want to consider the variability over time, that is non-stationarity of the models, and these are just indicating that at different points on a phylogenetic tree, uh, a model at a particular site in the protein um, might change due to whatever various causes. Now, one of those important various causes is molecular coevolution, that is the interdependence of evolution at different sites in the protein. So what I'm showing here uh, is, is, again, just very generally, if you imagine one site one, um, which has an R, and, and that substitutes to a D uh, in, in the protein, uh, and that basically causes a change in the process at this other site, site two. Sorry, this pointer really jumps around. I've got to get used to that. Um, but anyway, this at the other site two, there's a change in the process. That is, we can say process A, which is this process over here, goes and changes to process B due to that substitution uh, at the other position at site one. So that's what we mean in a very, very general way by um, molecular coevolution, simply the changes at one site 
may affect the processes that go on in another site, uh, and then we might like to detect it. Now, uh, I want to add in um, a really, really big complicating factor, which is uh, the idea of adaptation, which probably everybody's familiar with. Um, but we want to we want to think about two two basic um, modes of evolution uh, of proteins. That is how they're evolving, really, in the context of structure and function. And uh, that's that's thinking about well, uh, nearly neutral evolution. That is uh, Ota's idea that things that that evolution in functional molecules, um, the the fitness is sort of fluctuating up and down, and there's sometimes negative and weak positive selection. Um, but everything's kind of non-directional in terms of function. So we're getting fun we're getting substitutions. There's certainly selective uh, selection involved, um, but there's sort of no directionality, broadly speaking. So if we look at this uh, in terms of this graph here, we're sort sort of visualizing that as we have an ancestor, and the selective pressure then is to stay blue, and it stays blue all the way out to the descendant over here. Uh, in contrast, when there is selective pressure, what we might call adaptive pressure to be uh, to change, and in this case, I'm uh, just making a simple example of, say, the adaptive pr uh, pressure is to become purple, then we have the, the blue ancestor over time slowly becomes purple uh, until the descendant is purple. So we can call that adaptive divergence. Uh, and of course, we're used to the idea that that might lead to a burst of substitution uh, in response, uh, potentially in response to uh, the selection for altered function. Now, the big point of this in terms of, of thinking about coevolution and convergence and these kinds of things is that um, our research has really demonstrated, I think, that, that there are different modes of evolution and we need to think about how proteins evolve very, very differently. The characteristics of coevolution and convergence uh, in the context of an adaptive burst versus what we might call, these are quotes, uh, normal evolution um, can be very, very different. And I'll be showing some examples of that uh, later on in the talk. Um, but since we're talking about convergence, we brought up convergence now, we want to talk a little bit about what we mean and, and try to be pretty clear, because um, there's a lot of sort of confusion in the literature about some terms, particularly uh, the difference between the term convergence and parallel evolution. So um, in this talk, and generally speaking, I try to be consistent about talking about convergence as uh, this case to the left, where we have a common ancestor. Those common ancestors diverge. They leave descendants. And at some point, there may be convergence of some feature uh, in, in, the, in the evolutionary history that sort of brings those, those two divergent uh, descendant lineages closer together than they otherwise would be. In contrast, um, I'm going to restrict parallel evolution to meaning cases where you have replicate ancestors uh, with replicate adaptive pressures. So this is talking about the kind of thing you might be able to do in a laboratory, such as the work of Lenski, Wickman, Bull, and other people. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll try to explain uh, why, why I do it that way and, and particularly just sort of contrast it to the literature. So um, one of the more interesting things, and, and Richard and I are, are in the process of studying this with some of our models, is considering how uh, convergence may change over time uh, in the context of, of real proteins evolving with structure and function and, and thermodynamics in place. So um, we can view this as sort of broadening out that convergence curve and thinking about the probabilities of different convergences at different points in time as they diverge. Uh, and, it's, and it's a really important question, I think quite interesting, to ask, um, do, they, do things change? Do, do you change both the probability of uh, what we might call neutral convergence and also adaptive convergence? Do those, those probabilities change over time? And I think most people think that adaptive convergence, uh, the probability does change over time, that it should decrease over time, um, meaning that as, as sort of what it basically the overall organismal context um, changes over time, the probability that even under the same adaptive pressure, the probability that the, the problem of, of sort of adapting to that new adaptive pressure, probability it'll be the same uh, in the two descendants is going to decrease because there's so, so many differences and so many more ways to do it. Um, and so in this context, sometimes, well, a lot of times people have called this parallel 
uh, sort of the early time of, of divergence. And so saying two lineages that are pretty close together um, can be carved parallel. But where, where exactly on a naturally diverging lineage you would choose to say it's parallel or not is, is pretty hard to determine. And um, there's a pretty nice uh, sort of opinion paper on this by a couple of guys who I am blanking completely on their names, um, but it was written a few years ago. Uh, where they really argued quite strongly that we should just drop the term parallel in this context and call this all uh, convergence, and that's what I'm going to be doing. Now, um, I also want to comment at the molecular level, because there's also uh, even further confusion with this term at the molecular level. And um, I would argue that we should look at, uh, we should view molecular convergence at the whole protein level as opposed, as opposed to considering individual sites. So what I'm showing you again is this uh, divergence-convergence graph, and when I'm, these are these bars are meant to represent uh, sequences, uh, with the idea being you might have this sequence that changed from an isoleucine to a leucine um, here, and uh, then to aspartic acid, uh, but this isoleucine to leucine change doesn't really change anything about the function uh, of the protein. It's simply a, a random neutral change, and that means then in terms of the probability of convergence, it's no different from this isoleucine to isoleucine uh, non-change, uh, which is la later followed by um, a change to uh, glutamic acid. Um, and so the problem is that's that's been argued, it's, it's been argued, um, I think due to a logical fallacy that we should sometimes call when, the, when they're both uh, starting from the, say, if these were both isoleucine uh, here in both points, that that should be called a parallelism, even though the protein has diverged. Um, and there's a couple of problems with that. One is that just that the average rates don't really matter. Um, you always need to calculate the significance and account for multiple tests, and you need to do that with the best model possible. Um, we also have, um, we, we have to basically say, you know, basically estimate what the evidence is for neutral versus non-neutral or adaptive evolution. And we want to do that extremely carefully uh, include in terms of the model. Um, the second point is that most prior substitutions at a site are Ill, irrelevant to function. So um, the proportion, the yeah, most of, let me see, sorry, let me slow down here. Um, that is, most of the prior substitutions that you think are going to happen are going to be neutral. Um, so it's going to be essentially not really relevant to the function that's changing when the when um, an adaptive uh, an adaptive change an adaptive convergence occurs, um, we also have the problem that there's that the proportion of these sort of neutral uh, substitutions um, that have already happened are going to change over time. So by by counting on that that that, that previous substitution, say this isoleucine and leucine, uh, and making a big deal about it, you're looking at something that's going to be dramatically different at different points in time. Um, and then finally, just in terms of what we want to look at, uh, we want to think about what sites are most likely to be involved in uh, adaptive convergence. And in fact, fast sites are more likely to diverge and then converge, uh, but it's the slow sites that are more likely to be functionally important. Um, that is, uh, because they're functionally important, they're likely to evolve slowly, and that means they're more likely not to have changed uh, ahead of time before the convergence event. Um, and so, therefore, we need to really focus on um, adaptive convergence overall and probably focus on those, even those more conserved sites that are most likely to be of interest in terms of adaptive change. So, um, given all that, uh, trying to be clear about what we mean by convergence, we want to talk then about measuring convergence. And um, this needs to be done. Uh, it was best done with Bayesian integration over ancestral states. So uh, we showed a while ago, um, and then also again in the in directly for convergence in the PNAS paper in 2009, um, that we don't want to you don't want to assume that there's a correct ancestral re state reconstruction, uh, because oftentimes those um, a, a single ancestral state con reconstruction is is very biased. Uh, and that'll give you biased results in estimating um, levels of convergence. So what we want to do instead is to do Bayesian analysis and Bayes Bayesian integration over those ancestral states. And then we want to compare two branches. Uh, what I'm trying to show over here, basically, of picking out two 
green branches and comparing what's going on on those two branches. So we want to make sure that they aren't sister taxa, otherwise you'll get um, nonsense results, because if you think about it, with sister taxa, any uh, convergent event will be pushed up to the ancestor and appeal, appear like a, a change on the ancestral branch. Um, and then what we do is we count the sites with changes on both of those branches. So uh, those sites um, we will call, uh, the, some of those sites are either the doubly divergent sites, that is they change to different amino acids, or we call them convergent if they change to the same amino acid. So again, we're counting all the sites that change on both branches, uh, and then we're dividing those sites into doubly divergent um, and convergent. And there's a lot of expectation that uh, depending upon the lengths of the two branches involved, uh, the ratio of the doubly convergent and the convergent uh, changes will remain constant in um, a broad range of, of sort of nearly neutral evolutionary models uh, as long as the, the process doesn't change um, at, at, the two, at the site involved. Okay, so I'm going to get to um, talking about uh, some, some results from uh, real work. And first, I'm going to go back and, and just review quickly uh, the recent um, work with Richard Goldstein. And this is just published last month in, in PNAS. Uh, and this is a work on the evolutionary stoke shift, what I call jokingly here, the Tau of protein change. Um, and the basic idea of this is that we can, you can go back and start with a null model of sort of a Halpern and Bruno type of model where uh, every amino acid at a position has a fitness and it has a constant fitness. And um, then given, given that constant fitness, we can use... Uh, Kimura fixation probabilities, and we can use estimates of the mutation rate to get the probability of, of the, the instantaneous substitution rate. Um, again, not going over the details real strong, but if you want to you get further details, please uh, go back to Richard's talk, and he gives a lot there. So um, the questions then in this we want to ask are how does the substitution process change uh, in the context of a, of a structural functional model? Um, and how does it change when the focal amino acid changes and when adjacent amino acid changes? And how quickly does the substitution process change? So uh, again, as Richard described in greater detail, what we're basically doing is, is doing a thermodynamic model where we calculate the free energy of a sequence to fold into a native state versus the probability that it folds into 10 to the 160th power other um, alternative states. And then the fitness is based upon the probability uh, that the sequence actually ends up being in the native state as opposed to those alternative, what we call unfolded states or misfolded states. Uh, and there's a couple of, a uh, number of basic results about this I wanted to go over. Uh, and the first is that the marginal equilibrium frequencies shift with substitutions. So that's something that's unexpected in most models. Um, Certainly in the Halper and Bruno model, you're assuming that those marginal equilibrium frequencies don't change at all. And uh, what we're showing here uh, is just a simulation on that thermodynamic model, and we're showing the, um, the, the propensity uh, at a single site, site 167, and we're following when there's a substitution to various amino acids. What we're seeing here is that the propensity of those amino acids tends to be quite high. Um, as, as it goes along, and the propensity swap uh, depending upon which amino acid um, is in place. So um, what we would expect normally if there was uh, no coevolution is we consider just exchange between two amino acids at a site is something like this. We expect the, the change in the free energy uh, to be equal and opposite uh, in general and in both directions. And so with this model of evolution, what we actually see is something like this, where instead, it's, uh, if, if it's um, changing from one amino acid to the other, uh, that's always a, a positive um, change in the free energy, which is bad, which basically means there's a general reluctance to make that change. Uh, so it means that the, that the uh, protein essentially is adjusting to the amino acid and becomes happier to the amino, with the amino acid that's actually at that site. 
Now we um, we check this by looking at, at real proteins, in this case ferrodoxin, uh, and what we use is the Rosetta program to actually calculate the delta delta G's of substitution going back and forwards uh, with different proteins that um, had diverged at different levels. And what we found is that the, the results were very much in concordance with our predictions uh, from our simulated models. That is, you tended to, the proteins tended to be adjusted with the amino acid that was there and not want to um, mutate or, or, or go back to the, um, to the other amino acid. Another quick important point about this that we saw uh, is sort of is, is what we call a, a Fisherian uh, effect. Uh, and what I'm showing you here, now these are the averages of something like 3,000 simulations so we can get a nice curve. And we're showing uh, on average how with increasing substitutions following, um, following uh, this, this uh, substitution from an arginine to a, a um, aspartic acid, which is a positive to negative charge change, uh, what the propensity is for all uh, 20 amino acids at this particular site, which in this case is 110 uh, in the protein. And what you see, if, as, as we just said, is that there's a big increase in the propensity for the amino acid that's substituted. Uh, but we also see a, um, a, a corollary uh, increase in um, the, the propensity for glutamic acid. So this is the idea that the proteins, in adjusting to uh, the aspartic acid, it also um, tends to, uh, as, as a result, to adjust and, and prefer uh, a similarly charged amino acid. So the main points of this is that the evolutionary process changes over time as proteins co-evolve. So amino acid co-evolution is central to understanding protein evolution uh, and its utility um, in its phylogenetics. And it's important to understand that the average, in this case the time average, isn't the same thing uh, as, as the detailed process. Um, there's a strong evolutionary stoke shift following the substitution. And again, by that we mean an adjustment uh, to the amino acid that's there. Um, and there's an associated shift uh, called sort of a Fisherian shift in preference for similar um, amino acid. And so the idea here is that the Fisherian paradigm, that is, that you tend to want to evolve uh, to similar things, and, and you'll, be, you'll be more okay in terms of fitness if you evolve to similar things, um, is held by the preferences uh, for the different amino acids and not necessarily the rates. Okay, so um, moving on, uh, one, one um, thing we want to think about here then is, is what does this mean in terms of uh, evaluating protein evolution in, in, in real cases? And um, this, is, this is really more a schematic about what uh, we think we should be thinking about here um, more than a result. But the idea being is, is that we might think that over some parts of the tree, um, there might be a coherent process uh, of evolutionary change at a particular site. And in another part of the tree, which I'm trying to point to down here, uh, there's a second coherent process that differs from this first coherent process. Um, and in between them, at some point, there might be a fluctuating intermediate process. Uh, and that might be um, a single transition point, or it might be a graded process uh, moving from one process to the other. Um, and we think that the, the, our hope for basically understanding how proteins really do evolve and how they might change processes at sites uh, involves thinking about the time scales and the idea that there, there could be a token uh, there, there's likely to be coherent processes that don't change all the time, um, but then to change uh, sort of uh, quickly uh, on, on some branch or range of branches, and then they stabilize again. Um, and that's, that's something that we're focusing on in, in current analysis. Um, and then the second idea, of course, is that, that those changes then might be predictable based on um, structure and coevolution, so interactions between sites. Uh, now this is one case where we don't, I don't I'm not going to show anything from our, our simulation model because there's a really big limit here to what we believe um, the, the reliability of, of those simulated models. Uh, and we'd much rather start to ask these questions uh, in real proteins to see the degree of predictability of changes dependent upon um, actual coevolution in adjacent sites or sites that seem to be 
to be paired and likely to cause coevolution. Okay, so now I'm going to um, shift processes again and, and look at, at a more uh, detailed detail analysis of some real proteins. And here I'm going to be looking uh, at mitochondrial proteins. And so this is a, a subsample here of the um, vertebrate uh, or tetrapod, rather, mitochondrial tree. Uh, and this is work that was published a few years back, um, Casto et al. in PLOS One and Casto et al. in PNAS in 2008 and 2009, which I'll mostly be talking about. But this gives uh, some really nice examples of the interaction between adaptation uh, and coevolution. So um, standard slide, uh, everybody knows mitochondria powerhouse is a hot cell, very important. It's got a genome in the center of it, and this genome codes for some very important components of uh, oxidative phosphorylation. So these, of course, are, are key proteins, and without them you die. And, and a lot of these proteins, particularly the ones encoding the mitochondrial DNA, and particularly, for example, uh, the ones encoding um, cytochrome oxidase, are very, very conserved because they're at the functional core uh, of the protein complex. Um, so this, this slide uh, shows um, that adaptive bursts can cause dramatic change at, at otherwise conserved sites. And what I'm just showing you here is uh, the number of placements um, at sites otherwise conserved across tetrapods. So what we have here is what we call unique site replacements in different proteins. Uh, and we noticed that, um, if I can just go back a couple of slides, uh, so what we're seeing here is that there's this big acceleration in snakes, right? So they seem to have uh, accelerated evolution of some kind. And what we're seeing here is that that acceleration, that is this extra replacements, are distributed across a number of proteins. Uh, and when we do tests for positive selection uh, along different branches, in this case we can focus in on the allopinophidian and the ancestral snake branches, uh, we see that there's a lot of evidence uh, for um, excess uh, selected sites, and particularly in these same things here that seem to have excess replacement at otherwise conserved sites. So looking at this data another way, uh, we can show this here, uh, where every, every little dot here in, in that, that's hollow uh, is representing a branch on, on the tree, on, on the tetrapod tree. And we, generally speaking, see a pretty nice correlation between um, the synonymous transversions and the non-synonymous transversions uh, in, in the different proteins. And here we're using transversions because there's a lot of, there's an excess number of uh, transitions in mitochondria and, and they saturate pretty quickly. Um, but what we can see what really stands out here is uh, this excess replacements in cytochrome oxidase 1 in the allopinophidia. Uh, and the snakes. So hopefully everybody can see that. Um, and what that, the, the, the summation of that analysis is that there's really strong evidence for a really big uh, adaptive burst at those two deep branches uh, in the snakes. Now, um, how this relates to coevolution is really quite interesting. So there's so many changes along these branches that we decided to focus on unique residues. Um, that is, uh, at the time of this, of, of the analysis, these were residues that were completely conserved in the rest of the tetrapods that we were looking at, uh, and then changed uniquely somewhere in the snakes. Um, and what we see is that these unique residues cluster very strongly into either pairs, and in one case up here, a triplet. Uh, and, they're, and they're occurring in very functional locations. So these are the Proton channels, which are which are key to cytochrome oxidase function, and the oxygen delivery. Um, and to show that in a more graphic way uh, that hopefully people can relate to, um, what I've done here is just showed uh, shown the the pairs uh, in blue and red uh, that are physically paired in the structure. And again, these are the unique substitutions that are physically paired. And this is just either numbering or not in a couple of different views. Uh, where you can really see that, in fact, these are these are sort of lighting up like a Christmas tree and looking really interesting in terms of the fact that they're paired. And uh, you know, I've studied coevolution for a while, and this, when I saw this, this is the first time I've ever seen such direct physical 
pairing uh, in the protein structure. So um, again, driving back to that idea that there's different modes of evolution, uh, we basically, my interpretation of this uh, is that in fact, the reason you have such strong physical pairing in this context is because it's adaptive evolution. Uh, and you can think about this in a, in a way, um, so if you imagine, if you imagine normal coevolution, if there's a really tight compensatory uh, relationship between two adjacent amino acids, which we know from mutagenesis studies there often is, right, then, um, then, you, then you can say, well, it's actually unlikely that you'd see any of those two intermediates uh, occurring during normal evolution because both of those intermediates are likely to be deleterious, right? So they need to be, because the need to be compensated is so strong, you don't get any of those two, either of those two intermediates. But in adaptive evolution, you might have a reason to change one of those two uh, amino acids in the pair uh, for outside reasons, that is for selective reasons, to adapt to uh, the new functional preference. Uh, and then when you do make that change in the adaptive context, then the second change is going to follow because it's compensating to maintain the structure better and sort of get the structure uh, back into equilibrium and back into sync with itself. All right. uh, so um, here's just a nor some more examples uh, from this to, to think about um, the relationship between uh, convergence coevolution and, and uh, adaptive change. Um, in this case, I'm focusing in uh, again on this as part of the snake phylogeny. And we're looking at the uh, channel B, again, one of the proton channels that's involved in direct coupling. Uh, and what we can see here, if you look at the, the changes that I've highlighted on here, and on the left, I'm just showing where these amino acids are in the channel. Uh, and over here, I'm showing that we have on the ancestor of all snakes, um, this uh, S108A and S, sorry, I didn't mean to do that, uh, T146A, uh, which are two changes that are, let's see, right here, right next to, really, really quite close together, right in the middle of this proton channel. Now, um, if you follow the evolutionary, uh, uh, the evolution after these changes occurred, we can see that in one case, there's a reversion here uh, of A108 back to serine, right? Um, but in the other two lineages where that doesn't happen, we see three knock-on changes that are, interestingly enough, um, uh, at, happening at the exact same amino acid positions between these two, uh, between these two branches. Uh, and in this case, it's, it's interesting that they're not, they're not technically convergences to the same amino acid, uh, but they're often changes, um, they're convergent in that they're changes that are happening at the same site. Uh, and in some cases like A114 to S and A114 to T, they're the same sort of type of physicochemical change that's occurring. Now, um, we also see uh, a sort of something that's interesting as a result, which is that these changes, these adaptive changes on these different branches seem to have triggered, in this case, a bunch of subsequent convergent changes, mostly to the uh, same amino acid at position 502. Um, although in one case to a different amino acid and in one case a reversion. So again, sort of an interesting case of, of what's apparently knock-on effect. And I should say that otherwise, outside of snakes, again, this is a quite conserved position. So seeing this many changes uh, is quite surprising unless the physical context has changed. Um, uh, and then further, what we really find, and this really sort of was the icing on the cake here, in terms of thinking about convergence uh, uh, and showing what's happening and showing that these changes really are related. Um, we looked, uh, af after we started the project, we found uh, there, there was a new sequence of Rhinura, which is sort of a distantly related uh, legless tubular squamate. Um, and it also had some of these same changes in the channel D of the cytochrome oxidase one. And so what I've done here is I've circled the changes that also occurred in the Rhinura and you can see a lot of these changes because I've circled, I've circled these three changes because they're the exact same, that is they're convergent, exact uh, convergent copies of the changes that happen uh, along the snake branches, um, but in the Rhinura 
And then also a change here that um, is not convergent, right, but is, uh, well, you can see where 114 is here. It's, it's basically very, very close in the same channel. So it's, a, it's can probably potentially convergent in terms of the phenotype, in terms of how it's altering the channel, but it's done it, uh, it's done the same type of change as you see here with P146A, but at a slight, a slightly different um, amino acid. Okay, so again, potential convergence in the phenotype, but not necessarily uh, exactly the amino acid, but three examples of exact convergence of the amino acid. Um, I'll just whip through this a little bit quickly, but uh, if you if you go back and look at the paper, it's pretty interesting. There's actually a lot of there's there's a number of other different cases, so it's not limited to just that one channel. This is looking at channel K, uh, where we have proton delivery to the reaction center, and in a bunch of these cases, we have an increase in positive charge, sort of all around here at the mouth of the channel that's delivering to the reaction center, um, and we have these changes occurring on a couple of different branches, and what's really impressive about this is that we have some of the same kind of thing, uh, again, in the Raynura, but at this different channel, that is an increase in positive charge at a couple of amino acids. At this point, um, though, noting that these are, some of these are different amino acid positions, right? This is T490K, uh, which is a different amino acid position than you see here uh, in the snakes, but still happening right down here. Uh, it's hard to use, sorry about this, it's really hard to use this pointer. Um, right down here at the mouth of the channel. So different amino acids that are having the same sort of phenotypic effect uh, with the same kind of physical chemical change, uh, but not always convergent in the amino acids, although this one up here at top at 489 is a convergence um, of the exact amino acid. Okay, so uh, now um, we want to move on to thinking about what's the effect. So this is phylo seminar, so we've got to talk about phylogeny a little bit more at some point. Um, so one of the big problems or, or concerns about convergence is the potential for what it does um, on, on phylogenetics and phylogenetic inference. And what I'm showing you here, and this is from the PNAS paper now, is if we look at snake lizard phylogeny <coughs> uh, and we build the phylogeny from the mitochondrial trees, um, we put these acrodont lizards here, uh, right as sister taxa to all the snakes, which are in, in, in sort of gold brown here. Okay. Now the problem, if you talk to any morphologist or if you look at the nuclear data, uh, the problem is that everybody else thinks that the acrodonts are over here with the iguanidae. Um, so this this seems kind of bad in terms of, of uh, phylogeny, or it's certainly a big question why this would happen. Uh, and we dove into this to try to figure out what was going on particularly because we were suspicious about that big adaptive burst going on on the snake lineage. Um, and uh, what we're showing you here now is <coughs> the, the uh, sort of excessive convergence uh, at the amino level, acid level that's going on in the snake agamid pair. So um, this is a little bit of, of a complicated slide, but you remember at the beginning of the talk, I talked about measuring divergent and convergent substitutions. Um, and the reason we did that, we expect that the ratio between the two uh, is, is relatively constant most of the time. And this is showing that um, empirically that's actually true, right? This is divergent substitutions at convergent substitutions looking at a very, very large number of branch pairs. And you can see that there's a really a pretty good linear uh, relationship, uh, but we can see that the snake agamid pair really stands out uh, as being outside the range of what we um, would expect. Now, um, we can ask why this is happening. And uh, what, I'll, what I'll show you here is what I'm showing you first is that fast sites converge a little bit. Um, so what we see, I'm pointing with my pen, that's not doing any good. Um, we see the posterior number of substitutions on the x-axis and the probability of convergence on the snake agamid uh, branch on the, the y-axis. And we can see that there's a little bit of change in uh, potential sort of interaction of long branch attraction or neutral homoplasy. Um, but what's re really interesting is that we see the probability of convergence goes way up um, with, with uh, convert, uh, conserved sites. 
So the convergence, the really strong convergence, strong probabilities of convergence are happening at highly conserved sites. Um, so again, that's, that's far more consistent, not with neutral homoplasy, but with the convergence being caused by adaptation. That is adaptation, which is changing the function and choosing the otherwise conserved sites uh, in order to affect that functional change. Um, this is just looking a little bit more detail. Again, this is in the paper, but just showing you that a lot of this stuff, uh, a lot of the support for the sort of mitochondrial tree, which we think is the wrong tree, is happening um, at isolated positions, and it's happening at first and second positions in the codon, as opposed to a little bit at third codon positions, and, and basically nothing at neutral um, third codon positions. Okay, so again, indicating the role of the amino acids uh, and selection for function. Finally, I want to get back to that point about phylogeny. Um, what we find, or what we found, is that, that we can screen uh, some of these convergent sites out of that tree, uh, and that that effectively, um, when, when we then re build a phylogenetic tree with the remaining sites, and this is with the top 5% of convergent sites screen, um, the rest of the data basically snaps back and gives you I'm trying to point over here to this branch here. It gives you um, the the agamity branching uh, joining back as sister taxa with the iguanidae, uh, which is what the nuclear data and all um, all herpetologists basically expect. So there's a latent signal for the correct tree present in the tree, but that signal is is uh, being disrupted by these convergent uh, sort of the deterministic convergence between these two branches, which it messes things up. So molecular convergence then, um, what we're showing is we've got a massive uh, multi-protein event. Um, it implies a broad, intense adaptive pressure. Uh, and, and it gives us a sort of perspective on protein evolution that conserved sites tend to be the targets of adaptation. Uh, and that there might be limited paths for adaptation. Um, and then finally, that there's a big effect on phylogenetic inf inference because convergence sites can strongly mislead phylogenetic inference. Uh, and we showed even that one site, um, in the absence of any other signal, a uh, one site li like what we're seeing here can lead to a significant um, SH test, which is really, really bad. That means one convergence uh, event could really mess up your phylogeny or, or make you very confident in a wrong phylogeny. Um, uh, sort of a, a graphical thought about the, thinking about what this means about the constraints on functional topology, um, what we view this is you can think about the sort of ruggedness of the adaptive landscape as either this picture on the left uh, where, where we're talking about the top of the peaks and there's these sort of sharp arete ridges going from one peak to the other versus sort of the rolling hills of California uh, where if you were just walking along out in the field, you could choose many, many different paths to get from wherever you are to the next adaptive peak. Um, and, and the results here show that in some cases, in fact, the picture on the left may be, may be the case. And, and if you have the adaptive pressure that's saying move over to this next peak, that there may be a lim relatively limited number of ways that you can affect that change in protein structure, which is, which is a little bit of a surprise uh, to some people because you think that, that maybe there's a lot, there ought to be a lot of different ways um, uh, to, do, to affect the same change in, in proteins. Um, so we're running somewhat short on, on time here, so I'm probably going to skip over uh, just these next um, two slides, other than to say the point of them was just to say that we've shown that the, knowing the details of the model can be extremely helpful for, for sort of parsing out uh, the, the differences. Um, and, and what's, what's going on in terms of co-evolution and convergence and, and adaptation, all these things. Uh, and so ignorance is not bliss. Uh, and we developed, and this was published um, in 2010, so a couple of years now, we've been developing methods to get uh, better models that we think reflect biological reality uh, and allow greater sort of complexity without, without um, a big, big computational cost. And so this is, uh, a program we call Flex, which is available. And um, we can use that to classify the exchange matrix, uh, rate matrix very, very rapidly. 
Uh, and this is just a quick analysis of how much more rapidly we can be. Our method here, we call this B1U uh, in the paper. And actually, we're, we're quite happy about this. Even for a simple nucleotide GTR model, um, it can go considerably faster than a number of different sort of alternative methods. Uh, but the point of it wasn't actually to beat these methods on a GTR. The point was to improve the scaling uh, really for more complex models and be able to do those faster and, and kind of in real time. Uh, and so this is just showing you some different uh, levels of complexity going from a DNA model to amino acid model to a codon model um, and showing the, the time taken uh, for standard likelihood methods versus B1U and on the right here showing the, the speed up that what that means. And what we're seeing is that we can speed up that the, 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 our, our relative speed up increases quite a lot uh, as, as these different models get more complex, uh, which is the point. Um, and, and this is even more true when we get to uh, talk, talking about coevolution, which is an even more complicated model. And we're working with a sort of integrated model of a phylogenetically integrated model of mutual information. Uh, and with that, we have apparent speed ups of up to 100,000 uh, fold. Uh, which is quite fun, and we're getting some neat results out of that. Okay, so um, with that, I, I want to um, just mention really briefly some uh, further interesting work on, on convergence, and this is work that we hope is going to be published uh, in, in press very soon. But this is looking at the um, transcription meaning, uh, machinery, looking at the evolution of transcription factors. And um, there's, a, there's a general conundrum we can imagine that if you have a, a transcription factor uh, here, A, that binds to a bunch of different binding sites, um, you can imagine if there's a functional change going to red that suddenly it's, it's not going to uh, work well with those different binding sites um, th that which were adapted to the previous form of the transcription factor. Um, and people have, have use that sort of logic to theorize that it's very, it's very, very difficult for a transcription factor to functionally change without duplicating or without changing those interactions to different sites. Um, that is, it would be difficult to accomplish this where you suddenly had uh, a change to the transcription factor, a uh, new trans set of transcription factor binding sites across hundreds or thousands of loci that match the new transcription factor. Uh, and what we see here, uh, <coughs> In SP1, we're able to show that, in fact, there's been this huge amount of convergent change where we have, um, and what we, so there's, there's like a, a, a great uh, number of, of sort of multiple convergent events in this system. But if you look at these two ancestral sites, what we have is convergence uh, in um, the site of the transcription factor, which was changed, uh, which led to a change in binding preference. Uh, which then led to changes um, in the binding site at uh, multiple transcription factor, um, multiple transcription factor binding sites. I don't have to, time to go into the, all the evidence, but what is really, it's really pretty impressive is we showed, we showed a bunch of structural evidence that this was the case, that is that this amino acid caused a structural change that could then explain uh, this change in the bindings. Uh, site preference. Um, and uh, we then also asked ourselves, well, how, how could this really happen? So what we did is we built an evolutionary model uh, with basically dominant benefits of the transcription factor binding. Uh, so basically assuming that good binding sites uh, or good binding interactions in a diploid are dominant to bad interactions. Um, and what we got with this is that once we implement this model, it is, um, it is uh, very, very easy, even with small selective pressure, to get um, evolution of the whole system. And what happens, if you look over here to the left of this left graph, is that you get a very quick rise in frequency of the transcription factor, which is in blue. And then um, that's followed by a slow increase of frequency of both the transcription factor and in red here, the cognate binding site uh, for the transcription factor. And what we're showing here in black is just a very, very slow, a much more slow decrease in the frequency of the um, 
the cognate binding site for the old, the, the wild type transcription factor in this simulation or this analysis, this population genetic analysis. So in fact, if you go through the math, uh, we showed that you can um, get these kind of changes quite easily. We also show that this tends to happen wherever possible by duplication uh, of, of the binding site. And by duplication, I don't mean actual physical duplication, but simply de novo creation of new binding sites um, in, in the, the binding site region. Um, and the lastly, what was really kind of cool about this is that this evolution of the system from, I, we basically have convergent changes in the transcription factor causing hundreds of convergent changes in all the binding sites that are associated with that transcription factor. Uh, and then this is all part of a co-regulatory system uh, with SP3 and SP4 up here interacting with the same binding sites as SP1. Uh, and then what we see is that this is apparently driven multiple convergence events in SP3 and SP4. And by convergence, I mean at the same site, the same homologous position and the same amino acid as what we saw um, in SP1. So really a, a fantastic case of things, uh, convergence of evidence um, of, of the, the selective uh, change occurring in this system, this functional change, and um, long-term causing sort of delayed long-term knock-on consequences. Um, so I guess I want to I want to cut out here just be uh, be done just before the time's up uh, in case there are any questions. So this is just summarizing some of these things. Um, I do want to mention one thing is that we're we're very interested in asking the question whether we can um, understand these binding of the repertoire of possible sites and better understand how uh, evolution can occur and build models that, that relate that, um, the, the biophysics of binding to fitness uh, in, in the evolutionary substitution context. And we just published a paper uh, in 2012, a method we call SOLDEX, which is a Bayesian method of, of using high throughput sequencing to look at these repertoires and now we're trying to incorporate that um, information into evolutionary models of, of substitution and fitness. So with that, um, I will thank many of the people who have done this, particularly Todd Casto, Jason DeConing, and Ken Yokoyama, uh, current postdocs who are all moving on to other jobs, and um, Richard Goldstein, of course, who's uh, my collaborator on, on the, a lot of the, um, the protein fitness-based stimulation work. And, of course, um, the National Institutes of Health and a little bit from the NSF and Roche 54 and other people for funding the research. Um, skip that. With that, I'll say thank you. And uh, I'll take any questions if there are any.